Thank you, Vicki, for that uh, wonderful, wonderful and warm uh, introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, uh, Ricky and, and Ellen, for your presence and uh, for your support. And as an old uh, university president, it, of course, pleases me greatly to see uh, two schools coming together uh, behind uh, such a wonderful uh, center as the Furman Center. Um, I'm especially grateful uh, to the Furman Center. Uh, I'm very proud that we are supporting your rigorous, reliable, and policy-relevant research on New York's housing market. Uh, you really are leading the way in revealing why housing uh, matters uh, as much as it does, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, this evening. Uh, I'm heartened by uh, the uh, strong showing uh, here in this room. Uh, it is pleasing to me to think that so many people would come out and uh, want to have a serious conversation about housing, and that's what we're going to have as soon as I'm done with the experts uh, who really know uh, about affordable housing and what the challenges and, and possibilities are. Um, MacArthur Foundation uh, shares the commitment that I sense is in this room uh, about affordable housing, its preservation and creation. Uh, we want to help make housing policy and practice work for more people in more places uh, around this country. Um, I've had a deep personal interest in housing for a long time, going back to my days as a student in New Haven, when as a summer intern I uh, worked uh, recruiting a mix of people to a 221D3 uh, project on the edge of the uh, Yale campus. And then when I was president of the new school, uh, NYU and the new school were both uh, in a period of robust expansion, so faculty and student housing uh, was very much uh, on my mind. And then as co-chair of the uh, 14th Street Union Square Local Development Corporation, I worked hard to gain community acceptance for the 94-unit uh, Genesis apartments on 13th Street that today provide uh, quality housing for low-income and formerly homeless people. So a combination of the topic uh, in the village uh, and uh, seeing lots of friends in this audience uh, makes me feel very much at home here. Home is where one starts from, uh, T.S. Eliot uh, once wrote. Few concepts are more primal, more universal, more emotionally uh, evocative. To discuss housing is to touch on the most deeply human places in our psyche and our society. The real issue in housing, after all, is not the buildings themselves or all the intricacies of financing. At the end of the day, housing is really about people and their communities who they are, the security they feel, the opportunities they enjoy, and how housing helps or hinders this nation's individuals and collective vitality. Our intuition tells us that decent affordable housing is central to education, health, employment, economic development, and lots more. Yet there's not enough evidence to make that case as powerfully as we would like. In a moment, I'll describe some remarkable early studies, and they're beginning to show the true importance of housing in reinforcing or eroding uh, other social policies. Such studies provide us with firm empirical evidence and the intellectual tools to understand the role of housing. But more is needed, and this evening I will announce a major new uh, MacArthur commitment to underwrite research at the intersection of housing and these other policy domains. But first, let me step back to examine the larger picture, to tell you a little bit more about MacArthur's uh, involvement in the field, and to explain why I believe this to be an opportune moment for positive change uh, in America. And I think it is not wrong to say that the future of our country and the future of affordable housing are uh, inextricably tied. I think it's fair to say that our uh, citizens on the whole are better housed than they've been at any time in our history. The dream of home ownership is a reality uh, for more people uh, in record numbers, and the houses are larger and better equipped than, than ever. But uh, there is a parallel reality that is much less encouraging. Uh, consider these data points. 
The Center for Housing Policy reports that in 2003, 14 million American households, and that's households, not individuals, spent more than 50% of their income on housing costs and or lived in substandard conditions, 14 million. The center's research shows growing problems among moderate income workers too, nurses, teachers, retail clerks, police officers, uh, are finding it hard to buy homes in 70% of uh, our nation's 200 metropolitan areas. The rental market, a vital part of a healthy housing sector, has eroded. In 2006, Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies reported that the United States lost a net of one million affordable rental homes over the previous decade, one million. And for every new co uh, low-cost unit built, two were raised, abandoned, or turned into condominiums and high-end two for one. And here in New York, two-fifths of the city's households make less than $33,000 a year. The minimum salary for a new firefighter, for example, is below that level. The Furman Center's newest State of the City report reveals that the number of rental uh, homes affordable to th these households dropped by more than 200,000 units between 2002 and 2005, a loss of 200,000. Now, this data pay, paints a very sober picture indeed. For many Americans, housing is a source of stress, and for too many others, it's a source of deep distress. People of color, the elderly, single parents, immigrants, and others with special needs are disproportionately affected. And this situation, I underscore this, is not acceptable for the richest society in the history of all humankind, and nor does it do justice for our country's fundamental values of fairness, security, and opportunity. The MacArthur Foundation is determined to elevate our country's attention to housing. Our grants and program-related investments to leading nonprofit developers, financial intermediaries, housing researchers, and policy experts make us one of the largest funders in this field. And just this year, we've increased our grant budget by 35%, and there's more to come. By the end of the current decade, our total investment in housing will exceed $250 million, and that places housing among the Foundation's top four priorities over its 30-year history, uh, and that's where it should be. I want to acknowledge, uh, as I speak about our commitment to housing, uh, Four members of our staff, three are here, uh, who are leading this effort, Julia Stash, our VP for Domestic Programs, who was, just by chance, uh, Chicago's uh, Housing Commissioner, uh, Deborah Schwartz, uh, who directs our program-related investments, uh, Erica Pothick, whose good judgment and keen insight assembled the portfolio of grants that inspired our decision to do more in housing research, and then Michael Stegman, uh, not here this evening, has come on board having previously served uh, at HUD as Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research in the Clinton administration. So you can see that we are, are serious about housing. We have a first-rate staff. We have more money to spend thanks to a rising endowment. And we have the passion uh, to move this country to a more rational and effective housing policy. Um, as was mentioned, but let me uh, fill it out a little bit more. Our program has three key elements, a special initiative to support the transformation of Chicago's troubled housing, troubled public housing into new mixed income communities. Those of you who traveled to Chicago remember those high rise uh, gallery style uh, ghettos that uh, went along the expressways. Those are all down now, no more. Uh, and they're being replaced on the same footprint with mixed income uh, communities that were opportunity, better housing, but uh, also opportunity for thousands uh, of families. Uh, the window of opportunity, the second uh, element, is a promising 10-year effort dedicated to preserving and improving uh, America's stock of affordable rental homes. You're quite right. Uh, we've gone against the tide and said that rental is really important to be respected. We all, uh, almost all of us, live in rental housing uh, at some point in our lives, and uh, there's nothing uh, 
about rental housing that is uh, lacking in virtue. Uh, it's, a, it, it's an important part of uh, American life. Our ambition is to preserve directly 100,000 units, but through policy uh, work that we're doing, uh, uh, really prevent the projected loss of a million units uh, in the, the decade ahead. In other words, we really want to take the loss of affordable housing down to zero. No number speaks uh, louder than zero. And the third element, and that's the one I want to stress tonight, uh, is research. Uh, significant support for research that builds our knowledge about how housing matters uh, is now uh, going to be given a, a greater priority from us. Uh, and I'm pleased to take this occasion for the first time uh, to announce a new initiative at the MacArthur Foundation. We're going to commit $25 million over the next uh, five years uh, to housing research. And I'll give you more details in a moment, but I think I'm right in saying HUD spends about $5 million a year housing, and so we're, uh, we're, we're going to uh, do that and, uh, and maybe some better. Even with uh, all the good work that we are funding and that people in this room are doing, uh, the need uh, for attention to housing continues to grow. It's clear that many of our current policies and programs are falling short. There's funding for new construction, but little exists for properties that need major repair to be preserved. It's recognized that housing can be an effective setting in which to deliver social services, but funding for these programs in housing settings is insufficient. Per capita formulas are used to ration low-income housing tax credits, uh, bonds, and other forms of subsidy, but this leaves dollars unused in some parts of the country even as unmet housing needs in other places greatly outstrip the resources at hand. In other words, it's just a mis mismatch. Um, but for all of the problems, there are also uh, reasons for optimism. Hundreds of cities, counties, and states have dedicated public revenue to housing trust funds. More than 40 states and localities have made preserving their existing affordable housing stock, uh, rental stock, a new priority. Uh, plans to end chronic homelessness are being adopted throughout the country, aided by a serious increase in federal attention uh, and resources. We might say this is a kind of seed time for reform in our country, uh, in which at the state and local level, uh, good things uh, are happening that uh, are providing models, some of which will be taken up now, uh, some later. Uh, but the hard work of uh, thinking through and showing uh, what works uh, is underway. Mayor Bloomberg and Housing Commissioner Donovan are undertaking a $7.5 billion housing plan here in uh, New York. MacArthur is pleased to be supporting this effort, which aims to build or preserve, I think I'm right, Sean, 73,000 homes uh, in the next uh, few years. Is that right, 73,000? Preservation. Um, and more on top of that for new construction. Um, and the new Congress uh, brings further hope. Uh, I say the new Congress. Uh, a full roster of proposed legislation promises to improve materially the environment for affordable housing. The first of these measures passed the House uh, just two weeks ago, extending an important preservation policy uh, mark to market uh, for several more years. And it seems to me that uh, there is really a policy window uh, that may well be opening. We can talk about the past, we can talk about the things that aren't right, but we should also uh, look ahead uh, to the opportunity that may be just around the corner. I think it's easier now than at any time in recent memory to imagine that critical financial and regulatory barriers to preserving and improving uh, affordable housing will be overcome. Creative local models like the New York Housing Acquisition Fund are likely to be replicated across the country, and there may even be reforms like exit tax relief encourage the transfer of at-risk rental properties to responsible long-term preservation owners. So MacArthur sees this as a moment of opportunity. The foundation is planning to step up its support for affordable housing preservation across all of its uh, domains, and the aim is going to be to accelerate and reinforce policy uh, models and reforms that are taking hold throughout our country. Uh, 
Uh, and when you think about, uh, as we all often do, to spend an extra dollar on housing here or uh, a dollar on education in Nigeria or something in education or whatever, you have to ask yourself about the value added, about timing, uh, and it's our view that this is a moment when housing uh, should receive attention, not just from the MacArthur Foundation, but from uh, private philanthropy and from uh, the business community as well as well as the government. Housing advocates, practitioners, and policy experts can accomplish a great deal. No question, have accomplished a great deal. But our concern as we uh, sit here in this room is are we giving them the tools to make the best case? Um, it's my contention that we need uh, some fresh language. We need a new theory about how housing matters and why it is a critical path uh, toward other individual and community improvements to which we all aspire. And the new theory must be more than uh, a field of dreams. It must be built on high quality research that yields evidence to persuade across the political spectrum. And that's why we chose this setting, uh, the Furman Center, NYU, New York, uh, to make uh, our announcement of our further commitment to housing and to, uh, to housing research because uh, this is a place which is synonymous with high quality, objective, complex, sophisticated research that doesn't sit on the shelf but finds its way into theory uh, and into practice uh, to the good effect of uh, helping uh, thousands and then millions of, uh, of Americans get better housing. With better evidence about housing's impact, we're going to be able to point more confidently at shortcomings in the current approach to uh, housing policy. Uh, we'll have a firmer sense of major changes we need to make, not only in the near term, but over the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Better and more knowledge about housing as it relates to schools, jobs, health, and economic growth will significantly change the attitudes among policymakers and, we hope, among the general public as well. In other words, not only change the conversation, elevate the attention, and get housing the attention it needs. Social science has produced data-filled volumes on the impact of the welfare system, welfare reform, on early childhood learning, on other safety net programs, but far less is known about the impact of decent and affordable housing, and it's time to close that gap. It's time to give housing research uh, its due. We know how to do this in other domains, we just haven't done it adequately in housing. How does housing affect an individual's health, cognitive ability, or academic achievement? How does sec uh, secure housing give children a sense of self-worth and improve their ability to, to learn? How does it support a young adult entering the workforce and building a career? How essential is it to healthy family relations, responsible parenting, and engaged citizenship? These are important questions, we need the answers. And how do housing patterns affect our communities? Does subsidized housing really crowd out private investment? Do housing markets constrain or facilitate labor mobility? How exactly does a diverse housing stock contribute to the economic success and prosperity of an entire region? Uh, think about how much better we could do in advocating for housing if we had answers to those questions. Now, fortunately, uh, some scholars and some you're about to hear from uh, have been asking just these kinds of questions, and their findings um, have been important and uh, sometimes even uh, surprising. And it's really this early work, and I want to give lots of credit to the people I'm going to mention for being pioneers. It is really their work that has inspired us uh, to make this additional commitment. Let me give you some examples close up. Uh, Ingrid Gould Ellen, Amy Schwartz, and their former Furman uh, colleague Michael uh, Schill studied the impact of subsidized rental housing on neighborhood property values here in New York City. They found evidence that contrary to the conventional wisdom, subsidized rental properties can actually enhance neighborhood property values over the longer term. It's contrary to what uh, most people think. 
Uh, Stuart Rosenthal at uh, Syracuse studied cycles of urban decline and renewal over the past 50 years. His findings suggested that the condition of the city's housing stock is a major factor in such cycles, spurring owners to improve their aging properties not only maintains a good housing stock, but it appears to keep neighborhoods stable and protects against serious citywide decline. Policy implications of that are clear. Uh, Sandra Newman from uh, Johns Hopkins studies the relationship of housing affordability to children's well-being. The conventional wisdom has been that additional income spent on housing has a negative impact on a family's children. But her evidence, as she'll tell us, suggests to the contrary that children's overall welfare improved when parents found more expensive housing in better neighborhoods. Again, contrary to what we thought. A study of HUD's 10-year moving to opportunity demonstration has found improved mental and physical health among children parents who move from high to low poverty areas. The researchers speculate that these gains derive from reduced exposure to violence, which in turn may be lowering the stress, improving parenting behavior, and reducing asthma-related illnesses. And these benefits may still be more pronounced for kids if the move comes early in life. And finally, a study from 10 years ago at the University of Chicago by David Kerbo indicated that students who move have more absences, lower test scores, and are more likely to be held back a grade. Um, and sparked by that earlier work, uh, we're supporting new research to examine the links between housing, student mobility, and educational achievement. The students living in precarious housing perform badly at school, or those who are uprooted uh, as they have to move, as housing deteriorates or it's closed down in the middle of the year, do they do worse? Could a combined investment in both housing and education improve outcomes in ways that increased school funding all by itself does not? It's worth thinking about. Can you really, or in all this money, which many of our cities do as they advantage uh, improving education without attending to housing, are you really going to get uh, the return on the investment uh, that you should if you neglect, uh, neglect housing? Uh, I think we're going to find the answer to that is no two investments need to go together. Finding like, findings like these and the further questions they provoke remind us how much we have yet to learn about how housing matters. The evidence to date suggests that housing is a critical factor in opening an opportunity to individuals and improving whole communities. By testing this hypothesis in a rigorous way, um, we will amass a more complete and coherent body of evidence. So our new five-year, $25 million commitment is not to underwrite more studies of housing costs and affordability. Uh, we've done that. It remains important. Uh, we'll continue to uh, support this kind of applied research. Uh, but we hope now to promote new open-ended inquiry that will take a hard look at the complex impact of housing, research that will push our vision beyond incremental policy reform. And I firmly believe that we must look farther out uh, on the horizon to think beyond the constraints of the fragmented, inflexible, and overly bureaucratic uh, housing policy that is our lot today. The core of our plan will be to create an interdisciplinary research network that might go on for five or more years. The network will bring together experts on education, mental and physical health, labor markets, economic development, social environment, urban planning, and all the rest. Its scope will not be limited to a single program or policy. Instead, its charter will be to probe and understand the range of ways that housing intersects with people's lives and uh, affects the conditions in the, their communities. The network's research agenda will not be constrained by demands for immediate policy application hope to learn whether and how housing might be a threshold investment. Uh, is it, for example, a prerequisite for effective uh, public spending on education or for child care, health insurance, or income transfer programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit? And here I want to say uh, there's uh, uh, this network and the way we're approaching it very much reflects MacArthur's uh, philosophy about how to help cities get better 
sustainable basis and open opportunity for people who live in cities. And we're doing this uh, in Chicago where we're working in 16, about half of the high poverty neighborhoods. We've made a 10 year commitment and we've said, we need to work on everything at once. Uh, it just doesn't do any good to have the flavor of the year of the education over here and uh, healthcare over there. Uh, people are people and they need all this help, uh, and they need it uh, in a reliable way over a sustained period of time. And uh, I'm not here making a special plea for housing as opposed to other investments. Uh, they're all important. Housing just hasn't gotten its due. So we're trying to level the playing field, not at the expense of uh, these other investments, but as an indispensable uh, part of uh, a whole approach uh, to getting our cities better. By the way, a topic for another talk or in the uh, question period, I can tell you more about what we're doing in Chicago and the early results are, are very encouraging. Uh, in addition to the, the, uh, this research network, other elements of our multi-year housing research initiative will include support for important demonstration projects, evaluation research to test the uh, value of policy innovations, rigorous cost-benefit studies, and an analysis of factors controlling the supply affordable housing. Cost-benefit studies of particular interest to me because I think uh, we need to change the way our country thinks about um, the connection of individuals and trouble and need and uh, the larger interest of all of us. Uh, sometimes we've cast uh, those interests in opposition, but I think uh, in domain after domain, when you do the right thing for the individual, you're also doing the right thing for the larger society. It just makes good public policy sense, and I, I'm sure our housing work uh, will show that. Uh, but maybe not. Uh, there are uh, skeptics, I'm sure. <clears throat> there are people here who may be saying uh, housing is uh, an expensive and inefficient way to um, address the basic uh, problem of poverty. Others question programs that subsidize people uh, who have modest incomes but are not at the very low end of the economic uh, ladder even if they have limited uh, housing options. And perhaps uh, some of these skeptics will be uh, proved to be right. Uh, we must remain open to the possibility, but why not put the questions to the test through rigorous research? And I think that's, uh, that's important. Uh, MacArthur is going to be prepared to take heed of whatever the evidence tells us. Uh, but it's my very strong instinct uh, that uh, when the work is done, our hypothesis that housing really matters will hold up. And that in turn will strengthen the case for investments that provide all Americans with decent housing at a price they can afford. And as you've heard, MacArthur believes that housing is a critical path to individual growth and community vitality. And while the research is underway to test that proposition, we look forward to making common cause with our partners all across the country public, private, and not-for-profit uh, sectors who are working hard right now to strengthen and expand our nation's supply of quality, affordable housing. I didn't want to leave any impression that we were going to put everything on hold while we uh, did the research. Uh, uh, we're we're going we're to do both. Um, Harry Truman um, said this to the Congress in September 1945. I quote, a decent standard of housing for all is one of the irreducible obligations of modern civilization. The people of the United States so far ahead in wealth and productive capacity deserve to be the best housed people in the world. The irreducible obligations of modern civilization, pretty strong. September 1945. Four years later, the Housing Act of 1949 made this our nation's policy when it declared that every American deserved, and I quote, a decent home and a suitable living environment. That's the goal. That's the promise. That's the pledge. And I feel confident that the historical moment is at hand to realize our collective aspiration. 
our country's uh, great and good goal. MacArthur hopes the research initiative we've announced tonight will help change the conversation about housing and to galvanize the political will to realize President Truman's vision. How else can we expect our people and our communities to fulfill their true promise over the century that lies ahead? I thank you for your attention. I look forward to uh, our panelists' uh, questions. And I'll turn the uh, podium to uh, Ingrid Allen, who will moderate our panel. Thank you. So thank you, Jonathan, for those very inspiring words. Um, Jonathan, I think, has told us about a very exciting and a very ambitious new initiative um, at the MacArthur Foundation, um, and one which you know we're obviously thrilled about as um, folks who do housing policy research. Um, but he also has, has, I think, appropriately challenged us to think harder about some of the fundamental questions about the role that decent, affordable housing plays in revitalizing communities and, in, and shaping individual lives. Um, and I'm delighted now to introduce, um, if, albeit with half of my voice, so I do apologize, um, to introduce our esteemed panel of experts um, who are going to respond to some of the challenges that Jonathan has posed. And, and then we'll also leave time at the end for, for question and answer from the audience um, with both Jonathan and, and our panelists. Um, as I said, we, we truly have here an, an all-star lineup, um, an incredibly thoughtful group um, who have rich and varied, ex varied experience in the world of housing. Um, you can find their full bios in, in the programs that you were given coming in, so I'm only going to pull out some of the, some of the highlights from, from their very, very impressive careers. Um, first, um, Denise Scott is a managing director of the, the New York office of the Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. Um, LISC has long been one of the leaders in uh, the New York City affordable housing world, um, and, and their important contributions have, have uh, definitely continued and accelerated under Denise's leadership during the past five years. They continue to find creative opportunities to build and finance housing, um, uh, build and finance new affordable housing in New York City. Um, and Denise, in the past, prior to coming to List, has also had experience both in government um, at that in government both in in uh, the federal level and also in New York City. Um, I, I should also add that Denise, I think, is a very highly reflective practitioner, as we like to say at the Wagner School, one who thinks hard. Uh, about the work that she does and the impacts that it has on um, both individuals and communities. So we're delighted that she could join us in this panel. Um, second, Sean Donovan, who is Commissioner of New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development, where he is leading Mayor Bloomberg's um, ambitious new housing marketplace plan um, to a 10-year plan to create or create and preserve 165,000 units of housing over the next 10 years in New York City. Um, Commissioner Donovan was previously a managing director at Prudential uh, Mortgage Capital Company, and he was also served as acting FHA commissioner um, and, uh, during the presidential trans transition. Um, and most importantly, of course, there was a six-month period in his career where he spent, um, he spent as a visiting scholar here at the Furman Center. Um, and so we think these are the most important six months of his career. <laughs> and he actually was working appropriately on a MacArthur-funded project um, studying the uh, nature and extent of the expiring use challenge in New York City. Um, Sean has his hands full running HPD on a, on a daily basis and trying to build 165,000 units of housing. Um, but I do know him well enough to know that he also spends a considerable amount of time thinking about the very those the, the very questions, uh, the large questions that Jonathan has posed, and he delights in doing so. So we're thrilled to have him as well here. And finally, last but not least, we are very fortunate to have Sandy Newman with us. She is an outstanding and seemingly tireless policy researcher who has devoted her research to housing um, and social policy. And her recent research, as, as Jonathan mentioned, has focused on understanding the impacts that affordable housing has on the life chances of, of um, families and children. Sandy is a professor of policy studies and director of the Institute for Policy Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And, and like Sean, I'm happy to say she has an important NYU connection. Um, 
and we're, we're very proud to claim her as um, a graduate of the Wagner School. And in fact, she has two degrees from the Wagner School. She both has a master's in urban planning and also a PhD. Uh, Wagner was still alive, so it was not known as the Wagner School at the time. No, we still, we're still going to claim you as an alum, dear. Sorry, like it or not. So, all right. So, um, with that, what we're going to do is, is I'm going to pose some questions to the panelists, and I said, and I do promise that we will, um, we will leave time for question and uh, answer from all of you as well. But, um, Sandy, I want to start um, with a question for you as, as the researcher on the panel. Um, and, and I want to ask you sort of what ultimately do we really know about the, um, the role that housing plays in our lives and in the development of children in particular. So I mean, what does existing research tell us about the importance of housing to individuals and communities? Okay, I'm going to actually, I was given uh, uh, the information that I'm being given a little bit longer time to answer this question than I think we'll be taking in answering other questions. So. Uh, prepare yourself for a few more minutes than a typical quick answer. Uh, this isn't a quick answer. Um, I want to try to set the answer to this in a historical context. I think that's very impor important. And um, the truth is that, as Jonathan mentioned in his remarks, we actually know a tremendous amount about housing. Uh, this focuses very heavily on the hard bricks and mortar part of housing. We know a lot about construction. We know a lot about housing systems, building systems. We know a lot about finance, both in the private sector and in the arcane world of the public sector. And we know a lot about uh, good management, what it takes to be a good property manager. And I would imagine many people in the audience have contributed to all of these bodies of knowledge. We began to develop this information in the early part of the 20th century because we had to. We had cities that were rife with slums. We had immigrants teeming into the cities. We had a very dramatically increasing population. And the goal was to bring online, as quickly and efficiently as possible, decent and affordable housing. So historically then, to set this in context, it was very important to get these decent units online and decent housing was seen as an end in itself. That was really the goal. What's interesting to me when you go back into the historical archives is that even in the 20s and the 30s, there were some maverick thinkers back then who tried uh, very uh, diligently to broaden the focus. And they argued, I think quite eloquently, that the home could be or should be a positive element in human development, in social development. And in fact, the country ought to mark the progress that it makes in housing by seeing the extent to which the human development goals were achieved. Um, I think these folks were the out-of-box creative thinkers that MacArthur is thinking about for their network. For the most part, their perspective was not adopted, and one significant byproduct of that, I believe, is that we really don't know very much about the role of housing in the lives of children and families and communities. Or, to put it another way, we don't really know how improving housing carries with it benefits above and beyond the value of the housing itself. Uh, the good news, I think, is in the last uh, 10 to 20 years, we've started building that base of knowledge so that we've accumulated more knowledge on this topic in the last uh, decade or two than all the accumulated wisdom on the topic going back many more decades. The bad news is we've got a long way to go, but with MacArthur's help, uh, perhaps we'll get there. So now I do want to turn to your question. Um, my answer has to be obviously very simplistic and a broad overview. Um, and to help me, I'm going to divide housing into five key component parts and uh, let you know what I think at least we know about each one of these. So the first one, of course, is physical housing quality. This is what everybody thinks about when they think about housing. And uh, this has received a tremendous amount of attention from a broad range of uh, researchers, not only policy researchers and social scientists, but also epidemiologists, uh, people from public health, and so on. And the focus has been on how housing affects health outcomes, with a tremendous focus on environmental hazards in the home, uh, lead paint, asbestos, uh, allergens, and how this affects uh, respiratory health of children and parents, uh, cognitive functioning of children, and injuries in the home. Now, there is a big body of research on this topic, but there are some flaws in the research. And very briefly, what are they? Well, first of all, 
What this research has basically shown is a strong association between poor quality housing and these outcomes. What it hasn't demonstrated is a causal relationship between the features of housing and these outcomes. So why is this a problem? Well, we know that um, the people who live in housing that have these environmental hazards um, tend to be poor, socially disadvantaged. And uh, what the associational research cannot do is to disentangle the poverty and the disadvantage from the role of housing itself. So that is one of the goals uh, of future research. A second reason is something I'll call self-selection. And here's a, a story to illustrate it. Imagine that we do a study and we see that individuals living in uh, housing at a particular point in time have poor health and their housing is also a very poor quality. We might jump to the conclusion that the poor housing quality has actually caused the poor health. But imagine that um, you have an individual who actually became ill and because they became ill, uh, they had to cut back on their uh, job employment, perhaps they had to stop working entirely. Uh, they had to give up the housing they were living in. They had to find a much more modest and perhaps poor quality housing unit to live in. And in fact, in that particular case, what's happened there is the poor health has caused the poor housing for that family and not the reverse. The final issue is one that no one ever likes to talk about, but it's really at the core, and it has to do with measurement. Uh, the measurement instruments that we use to look at physical housing quality um, are really quite inadequate. They haven't undergone the kind of rigorous analysis that uh, we must do uh, to achieve good, valid, reliable instruments. So for example, the instruments that most researchers use have nothing in them about lead paint, have nothing in them about uh, other environmental hazards in the home. So we're completely missing that piece. Uh, fortunately, these uh, kinds of problems can be solved. Uh, good research design, very rich data, are the lifeblood of good research, and that's, I think, how we would solve the problem. Uh, quickly, to the second dimension of housing I want to mention, it, which is crowding. And again here, there's quite a lot of research, and again, it shows a, a strong association between crowded housing units and um, physical and mental health uh, outcomes, uh, uh, effects on children on grade retention, and so on. Uh, these studies also suffer from the studies, uh, the problems of the studies I mentioned earlier. Uh, a couple of things to think about here. Uh, the way we measure crowding is uh, simply persons per room, the ratio of people to the rooms in the home. But it is possible that the configuration of the household, that is whether the people in the household are both children and adults and the age of those children might matter for the experience of crowding in the home. Uh, that has not been taken into account. Another issue that is somewhat, um, I guess, uh, debated is whether cultural values play any role here. Some have pointed out that there are close contact cultures where having more people in the residence is actually viewed as a good thing, not a bad thing. Third feature is affordability. Uh, Jonathan uh, set up the problem very well. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that uh, a poor family living in a high uh, cost uh, housing area uh, we worry about them because we worry that there is going to be a threat to their ability to buy other basic necessities, food, medical care, uh, that the parents will feel very stressed. This may uh, create very difficult, uh, great difficulty in parenting. Uh, parents may need to hold multiple jobs. They're not available to uh, care for their children and so on. And then the issue uh, Jonathan also mentioned, which is residential uh, stability. Uh, being in an unaffordable home probably means you have to move around quite a bit. But the other side, which is somewhat less conventional uh, wisdom, is that high-priced housing is located in well-endowed communities. So these are the communities that have better schools, lower crime, uh, better facilities. Um, and uh, we're at the very beginning of this research, but as uh, Jonathan mentioned, uh, the trend in the research is really indicating that uh, the well-endowed communities seem to be compensating for some of the issues associated with uh, uh, the um, high-priced uh, housing markets. Now, what we do see, however, is for uh, a sort of upper stratum of families who are very uh, poor and persistently poor, uh, there are significant uh, issues, and so that's something that needs to be focused on. A third uh, or fourth topic, I guess, is subsidized housing, and very, very uh, quickly here, uh, the issues with uh, subsidies only has uh, particularly been whether there's a disincentive associated with accepting a housing subsidy on your work behavior, on increasing your income because of the uh, implicit 30% uh, tax on your income. 
Uh, the work that's been done uh, does not uh, um, uphold that particular concern. Uh, when we look at um, adults in assisted housing, there is, when they move into assisted housing, you do see a decline in their work effort in the first year or so, but then that neutralizes after a couple of years and they return to uh, a situation of working as they, uh, to the extent that they were working before. Um, with regard to children, the evidence to date is actually quite positive. There's uh, one study that's contemporaneous that uh, has found that children who grew up in assisted housing environments actually had better uh, grade, uh, moving ahead grade to grade than uh, comparably poor children who were not in assisted housing. In some work that we've done at Hopkins, uh, we have actually looked at the long-term outcomes of kids who spent their um, middle childhood years in public housing environments and then we looked forward to them when they were in their 20s at whether they held jobs, their income, or their welfare dependency. And we actually found that compared to comparably poor children not in public housing at the same age, uh, these children did better. Uh, there's been very little work on the um, uh, sort of interaction between housing subsidies and supportive services. Uh, the one study that's been done uh, by our colleagues at MDRC um, Jobs Plus, many of you may know about this, uh, it's very tantalizing results showing that uh, work readiness, job readiness, uh, support services had very beneficial uh, effects on uh, tenants in public housing and uh, uh, will be interesting to see additional work on that topic. Um, work that's been done more recently looking at welfare reform and the extent to which uh, housing assistance recipients who uh, mothers with uh, children on welfare, whether they respond similarly to welfare reform as uh, single moms with kids who are not receiving housing assistance, uh, there's now an accumulated body of evidence that, in fact, they do respond quite similarly uh, and that the housing assistance is not um, holding them back from uh, uh, fulfilling the goals of uh, welfare reform. And then the final piece, which is the spillover effects of subsidized housing, the work that uh, Ingrid and Amy and others here at NYU have done. Uh, of course, showing uh, the positive uh, spillover on uh, surrounding property values. And as Ingrid, of course, uh, mentions, you know, is New York uh, uh, generalizable to the rest of the country? And so you need to take the study on the road and do it elsewhere. Um, final topic is home ownership, which, uh, of course, um, many people focus on. There's quite a body of research on this particular topic. And most of it shows positive effects on children's outcomes, on their math and reading achievement, on their uh, behavior, on their high school graduation uh, rates, and so on. Uh, the question that those of us who have done this research uh, struggle with is, what does this actually mean? What is it about home ownership that is conveying these benefits? Is it, in fact, the residential stability that comes with home ownership uh, because uh, children's lives are less disrupted? But we don't really understand the mechanism there, so there's a lot more uh, to look at on that particular topic. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so, Shauna Denise, um, based on your real-world experience, um, I'm curious what you think. They sometimes, as, as much as I hate to admit it, sometimes research lags behind <laughs> practice in, in some areas. Yeah, um, so I'm wondering what you think we know about the importance of housing to communities and individuals. Okay. So let me first say it's really a pleasure to be here. Jonathan, your, your remarks were really very encouraging, and I'm hoping that that this focus tonight will really encourage more of us in the community, uh, in the in housing industry, and specifically the philanthropic community, to really do more to focus on this on this very important issue. And I also agree with you that this is really a very important window that we have right now, perhaps in this Congress, and certainly to help maybe influence some of the future administrations. And I think that that's that's really important. So, what do we know about the impact of housing on individuals and communities? At LIST, we operate with two basic assumptions. First, that, that housing investment in affordable housing specifically acts as a catalyst for broader um, community um, revitalization and improvement. And second, that it provides a foundation for individuals and families to achieve better outcomes in health and education and economic status. How do I know this? Well, admittedly, um, our evidence is, is we believe, uh, based not on the evidence that, that we're hoping that the research will, will lead us to, but we have pow powerful anecdotal evidence, and I want to share a little bit with you tonight and hope that as we go forward, the work that, that Jonathan is supporting and leading 
will enable us to, to put together more evidence-based research. So let me just tell you about a little bit about our powerful anecdotal evidence that's been demonstrated at, through LISC with our work with community development corporations. And over the last 25 years, we have been working and investing and helping to spur um, community development and building housing, mainly in partnership with CDCs around the, around the city. Over 60,000 units of affordable rental and home ownership units um, have been built in about uh, millions of square feet of commercial, uh, industrial, retail, and community space in these same neighborhoods. And this represents about $200 million in, in investment of loans and grants and another um, billion, over, little over a billion dollars in, in equity investment that has come in partnership with the city's billions. Um, Jonathan mentioned uh, the mayor's a 10-year plan and a new marketplace plan and the billions that have been committed there. And as we witness New York City's transformation, we realize that the numbers really don't tell the whole story um, and that these neighborhoods really have been rebuilt in many parts beyond the bricks and mortar, that we've literally remade neighborhoods. And in the Bronx, for example, which had lost over about a half of its population um, years ago when the, this investment was taking place in the city, is now beginning to repopulate and expanding its economic base. Or in Harlem, where commercial corridors have been revitalized and both local businesses and, and uh, chain stores now stretch the length of 125th Street. This activity began with the housing investment. Housing was the threshold investment. It started a chain reaction and it's grown. It's, it's what we see, this is the evidence that we have and it will be really helpful to be able to document what, what further impacts it has beyond just the physical. For families, it's clear we all agree that, that it's really important that people have affordable and stable places to live in and that there have been in recent market, the expansion of the market, the strength of the market has really put burdens on families and that the, the private, um, the escalation in, in the rental market especially has had a tremendous impact. And so it means that families are, are, when they have affordable housing, can be less stressed and have greater resources to devote to basic necessities. This is some of um, the work that we hope the research will generate more conclusions positively about. And it basically means we believe that families, and we see this in the, own, in our, the housing that we've been building, that families, as they become more stable in the neighborhood, are able to really participate more in the, in the fabric of the neighborhood. They can attend the block association or the PTA, elements of, of really being rooted in, in the community. Our challenge now is really to hang on to the resources and to attract even more resources. The downside of the whole revitalization process, it's soaring rents and property values have threatened that longtime residents will not have an opportunity to stay in the communities or benefit from the economic boom that's, that's the, serious, the city has experienced. The resurgence of the real estate market is really creating a growing affordability gap that is most severe for the poorest households, Jonathan mentioned this, but increasingly affects moderate and income families as well. And the problem is not just one of rising costs. For many families, particularly those on the lower income range, Wages have remained stagnant and the unemployment um, relatively high. And so even in the midst of an economic expansion, these families are really struggling to stay, to stay apart. This could become, maybe the research may prove this out, but we believe that we will find that, that many in today's generation may do well less economically than the generation before them, a trend that we obviously want to be able to, to stop. And while we confront the growing affordability gap that I just described, we're also facing a serious threat that existing affordable housing may be lost. This threat looms especially large in the federally subsidized housing, where thousands of units, um, mainly the troubled stock that is physically dis distressed and needs um, has been um, undercapitalized. Uh, but also we find that this is a problem in the unsubsidized private stock and we're losing units at an alarming rate. So preservation of existing affordable housing is the, at the top of the list housing agenda. And in New York City, even though there has been a co tremendous commitment of mayoral um, resources, and Sean certainly can attest to this, we're still facing a net loss of affordable housing uni units, especially affordable to low and moderate income families. 
And so we look forward to the, to the convergence of research with the efforts that we have on the ground to keep preservation higher on the agenda. Let me just end on this point by saying that, that once this affordable housing disappears, we can't, it's gone for good. You can't rebuild it, you can't recreate it. It's just a different world, a different level of cost. And so, and though it's not, not as visible as the housing abandonment that we saw 30 years ago, the loss of the affordable housing stock presents no less a threat to New York City's social fabric. So I think it's really important that we, that we look at this because we believe that the socio and economic and racial diversity of the city is really at risk of being, of being lost. So Jonathan, we thank you for your leadership here and look forward to working with you. Not sure there's anything left to answer on this question. Really, pretty well covered. <laughs> I, I, let me just make a couple of quick points okay. um, to, to try to round it out. And I, part of it, I, um, Denise has, has talked a little bit about it, but I think going back to the point Jonathan made about the work that's been done um, at NYU around the 10-year housing plan here in New York City, I, I do think we have at this point incontrovertible evidence that well-planned, well-executed investment in housing and neighborhoods can rebuild communities, can create a housing market uh, where there wasn't one or where it was disappearing, and that there are a, a range of benefits. The one statistic that Jonathan talked about that was really the focus of your work was the rise in surrounding property values as a result of housing investment. So counterintuitive, but at some deeper level, increases in property values were a sign of many things. Um, and that was an increasing value placed on that community uh, by the residents, uh, by a, a broader community. And we believe, and your work, I think, um, is continuing to investigate this through improved services, through uh, better educational outcomes, through lower crime, through a range of things that we value more broadly, not just within housing, um, but as good outcomes for a neighborhood. So I think, um, in going back to the, the fundamental question of what do we know, I think we do have good evidence about that power of well-planned housing and neighborhood investment um, to rebuild communities. And I think as we think about sort of the challenge where we sit today in New York City, it is that fundamental shift that we're facing from a challenge of abandonment to a challenge of affordability and I don't think, um, as Sandy has said, we know as much about uh, where we head in that direction and what the real effects are. We are we're beginning to see uh, some evidence that Sandy talked about, uh, about the importance of that, but I, not only in New York City, but more broadly across the country, the challenge for housing policy has more and more shifted away from this problem uh, of urban revitalization more broadly to the fundamental challenge of housing affordability. And I think the more we can focus on the benefits of that, and the more the research can be focused on that, um, the better. I, as somebody who's worked in the research world, but also spent a lot of time now at community meetings, um, at uh, various events with the mayor, one thing you very clearly see in New York City, I think uh, it was Jonathan Miller, a, a staffer who, uh, many of us in this room would know down on the, on the Senate, who works in the Senate on housing issues, uh, once said to me that politics is felt need. Um, and it's very clear to me that wherever the research might be on this affordability problem, that when you walk the streets in New York City, when you listen to just about any dinner table or cocktail party conversation, the fundamental challenge of housing affordability is something that people feel deeply and that they speak up about and they vote on. And so at, at that fundamental level, I think we know that housing affordability is a major challenge. What remains is sort of taking it to the level of really understanding the impacts on children, on families in a, in a deeper, more fundamental way so that we can design policies around those outcomes. Okay. Great, um, well you kind of answered my next question, which, which was really, um, you know, if, if, if the MacArthur Foundation were to come to you and ask you, how to prioritize this um, commitment, this major uh, new commitment that they're making. Is there one particular area that you feel that um, they should be supporting? Street, no question, um, uh, probably need to be looked at again and in a broader frame. Mm -hmm. 
agreeing with the fact that you can't single out a, a single thing, uh, one specific area. I do think that in the sort of era that we're entering in terms of the housing challenges that we have nationally, more and more I see the fundamental challenge of land use and its relationships to segregation patterns, to settlement patterns more broadly as a fundamental challenge. And I think if you look at New York City, we've gone from a period where, uh, and historically in housing policy, where government sort of controlled the game, where government uh, owned a lot of land, where government was the producer, uh, the subsidizer of all housing, and where fundamentally the, talent, the, the task of sort of rebuilding urban areas, which was the central challenge in much of, uh, of housing policy, was something really driven by government. And more and more, as the challenges of affordability, as uh, our metropolitan areas become more and more complex, I think the, the problem of segregation, the problem of the way that settlement patterns and zoning uh, patterns uh, make affordable housing uh, nearly impossible in many communities that essentially lock low and moderate people, uh, moderate income people out of those communities, that more and more we have to understand what the impacts uh, are of those kind of uh, market actions, uh, zoning actions, other regulatory uh, actions in terms of uh, the housing outcomes for people. And I also think while there has been some research around that, I would go back to Jonathan's point, we more and more have to frame these in terms of what are the costs not just to the individuals, but the costs to society more broadly. Recently, uh, MacArthur sponsored a very interesting conference uh, on sort of what the state of the art is about housing research. Uh, George Galster did a, a, an interesting thought piece about what if you were able to, uh, it, with the sort of flip, flip of a switch, redistribute uh, poor people and higher income people across communities so that you could lessen the segregation uh, of, uh, by income across the country. And he came up with a, a benefit simply in terms of the value of real estate um, because of the negative effects of concentrated poverty of literally trillions of dollars that it would raise the value of real estate across the country. And just thinking about that kind of experiment and the impact that concentrated poverty and concentrated segregation have on not just the individuals that suffer from it, William Julius Wilson and others have, have looked at that, but more broadly on the cost to society at large. To me, that's an area where we need to know more and we need to push the research because I do feel like in the decades to come, that will increasingly be uh, a fundamental challenge for housing policy in the US. And I agree with um, what my colleagues said. And, um, and also, Jonathan, you mentioned that, that while we were sort of moving the research forward, that there was still a lot of work to be done. And I think that I would sort of respond on that point and say that I think that there's a window um, of opportunity right now for us to be able to, to, to try and begin a dialogue that begins to shape a national agenda on this issue. And to the extent that we will, it will take longer to come up with the evidence-based um, um, research, but that at least we can begin really trying to put together, I think, a housing, a national housing platform, I think is an important next step because the window is, will, may close. And I think that, that one way to keep the window open is to be, is to be able to take a bold step forward. And, and even if, we, if we're visioning to some degree what we think a national housing platform should look like, I think that this is a body that could begin to, to shape that discussion. So well, can I just follow up on this, on this point, which is, Jonathan, you mentioned uh, that um, you know, a good deal of the success of philanthropy is sort of about timing and that there may be a window open now for um, that this may be a good time to welcome new innovations in housing policy. And Denise, you've said that as well. In what sense is there a, a window open? In what sense is the timing right today in 2007 to um, to shape a new policy. I mean, you know, it's one thing I, you know, I feel like I lose perspective in New York City when, you know, we have a, uh, announce a uh, discussion about housing policy and 650 people are SVP. That's, I think, unusual around the country. And I don't know to what extent there really is a policy window open. I hope there is, but. Well, we're, we're hopeful too. Um, I, I think it, I, I draw from our experience here in the city and working with Sean and with the mayor and, and as we sort of worked up to a, um, 
first this car, um, when Mayor Bloomberg first became mayor, leading up to his um, to his appointment, and then um, through his uh, into his second term, and we a number of the housing communities through Housing First really took the opportunity to define a bold housing agenda. We basically sort of took some of the, the anecdotal evidence that we had. We built on what we knew about, about the budget. We gave the city a, a real tall order. I mean, we're happy to say that the mayor, that the mayor stepped up. But, but, in, but, but nationally, I think that there's an opportunity for us to do something similar, to come up with a broad national agenda and, and it, yeah, we, we have more work to do to ultimately be able to, um, to define our story with, with evidence. But in the meantime, I think that there is a Congress that might be um, compelled to respond to, to something that, that comes um, um, at, from a coalition of, of national uh, thinkers on this and, and practitioners. And I, and I also think that there's an opportunity to inform how the next um, presidential administration um, shapes its platform goes forward. So I, that's the window that I, that I see. Just uh, two quick uh, footnotes uh, on the issue of the fantasy study. Um, I think that uh, you know, Sean's answer um, suggests uh, that there are many different levels to what it is we need to know. There's a macro level of markets and land use and sorting. There is a very micro level of behavior, families, children, so it, it's really sort of across the board and we shouldn't lose the notion that we're going from the micro to the macro and all of those are very important. In terms of the window, um, I do want to again make a historical point here. This one's close, uh, nearer history and that is um, uh, welfare reform. When welfare reform was being debated um, under a democratic president, um, there was the top tier conversation which had to do with work first and the goals of welfare reform. There was a second tier conversation that had to do with the various uh, supports that families were need, would need in order to meet the goals of welfare reform. The conversation was about childcare, was about transportation, was about health. Housing was not mentioned in that conversation. And um, there are, we can speculate on why it is that housing was not mentioned, but it was not part of the conversation and that was during a democratic administration. I guess um, the thing I'd point to, it sounds a little sick, but as a hopeful sign is that in the New York Times uh, last year, there was a front page story about the place in America that had the fastest growing affordability challenge. And anybody who'd expect to read it uh, in New York City would say New York City, or they'd say San Francisco or Boston. And the answer turned out to be Olathe, Kansas. And um, I think to me this comes back to the fundamental point Jonathan made about we are an extremely well housed nation at this point in general and that there have been dramatic improvements in, uh, in many, many places across the country. But as we've entered, uh, some would say housing bubble, others would say housing boom over the last decade, housing affordability has begun to be a challenge in the places that might actually move Congress. Uh, mayors have been focused on this, to some extent governors have, but it has really been a, a problem of the high cost areas. And I think the, the opportunity to the extent that people are starting, as I said earlier, that there's felt need about housing, uh, more and more I think it's the fact that housing affordability is becoming a challenge in places that it wouldn't have been five years ago. And that there is a to some extent, a rising chorus around uh, this, this problem, and one that might move the country more broadly, rather than just as a focused political movement in a few uh, cities or states uh, around the country. I also think that the issue of the house of home ownership, having sort of reached a level where um, it's fair to say that I'm, I think people are beginning to question, given predatory lending and a number of other uh, sort of developments, whether in fact our kind of traditional mantra of home ownership as being the primary housing goal of federal policy is something that ought to be today on the, on the front burner. As we reach 70% home ownership, as we're starting to see in the major press some of the, neg some of the downsides of that, I think it does you know, raise the question of whether a reevaluation of our housing priorities is, is right uh, at this point in time. Great. Um, to ask Jonathan, can you come up now? And then um, I think I 
I'd like to open it up now for from Q&A from the audience. Um, I do, um, one of the things about working at a center that's joint with the law school is I get warned about a lot of things I should say or I shouldn't say. So I'm supposed to tell you now that these, um, this event is actually being taped and maybe broadcast on the MacArthur Foundation's website. So just know that when you're asking your question, <laughs> that this could go down. Pass it down. So, um, and there are microphones in the aisles if, if you want to come and um, ask some questions. So, I mean, I have plenty of questions, so if you do not, I will continue to ask. But I have some questions either for the panelists or for Jonathan Fanton about, about MacArthur's new initiative or MacArthur's, I think you probably will be willing to entertain questions about MacArthur's initiatives more generally. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Great. And if you could just identify yourself as well. Okay, um, Corey, I work at J State. As we look towards um, sustainable models for affordable housing, can you share your thoughts on the limited equity model where resale prices are capped and talk about any new activity in that area? Um, the, I, I think New York, uh, is at an advantage in answering this question because we have such a long and broad history of, of working with limited equity uh, models. I think the challenge for us, and I think it's something that you see uh, reflected in many places around the country, is uh, the sort of trade-off between uh, growth of equity, uh, building assets for low-income households in particular, relative to the long term as uh, I'm not sure if that's what you meant by the term sustainable but the long term affordability of that of that housing and there's beginning to be I think uh, a real emergence nationally of focus on this issue because of the rising tide of values in so many communities and New York is a place mm -hmm. you know 20 years ago as we were beginning to uh, rehabilitate the in rem stock in Harlem if Anybody had told, uh, and I wasn't at HPD, but I'm imagining that these conversations might have happened. Did anybody come and said, you know, well, we're worried about that you may be giving a windfall to the potential buyers of those brownstones in Brooklyn. They would have looked at you like you're crazy. Yeah. Um, whereas, in fact, it has become a real issue, is how do you balance the long-term uh, sort of growth in equity for those, those buyers, which is, I think we would all agree is a good thing, but to do it in a way where the next buyer is one who can, uh, who can benefit from uh, the investment of government resources. And so the emergence of land trusts, the emergence of a range of models around the country um, is something that I think is a hopeful sign uh, on that front. Here in New York, um, we, through particularly inclusionary zoning, have begun to really push the idea, I think, of permanent affordability and to grapple with what exactly that means. And currently, we have a rental program for permanent affordability in inclusionary zoning, but we're actually working on and looking at models for permanent affordability on the home ownership side. And I'm hopeful that um, over the next year we can emerge with some new models beyond the limited equity uh, cooperative model as one that uh, a model that could be applied more broadly for permanent uh, home ownership uh, in terms of uh, home ownership in terms of permanent affordability. So. Thank you. Um, sorry. My name is Alice Labrie, and I'm fortunate to be in a Mitchell Lama middle income co op in Harlem called Esplanade Gardens, Inc. And I'm listening to all this, and I'm thinking to myself <laughs> unless the government, city, state, federal, is willing to buy land and build apartments that are affordable. This is all pretty hopeless because we live in a capitalist society and we can't prevent real estate developers from buying property. So what's the prospect, Sean, of the city buying some land and, you know, like a level above projects to make it affordable? I, I would agree with you to some extent, but not completely. 
um, in that it, land is clearly a very, very critical part of the game in terms of making this work, and it's, and it's an increasing challenge given the success of HPD um, in revitalizing and turning back over to private ownership um, so much of the land that was taken in REM. Um, and we've tried to find some creative ways to do that. I see Doug Apple, the uh, general manager of the New York City Housing Authority in the audience, and he's been a terrific partner for us. He's actually in disguise, so uh, he won't. Uh, I'm being challenged on secession rights, so I just wanted to know. Okay. Um, he doesn't oversee Mitchellamas, so uh, right, don't exactly. accost him after that. You're welcome. Uh, but we've actually been able to find, through a partnership with NYCHA, sites for 6,000 units of new construction within uh, housing authority developments. We're working with uh, the Department of Transportation on parking lots that they currently control that we can build housing on and uh, put parking underneath. We're working with the Department of Education. So there's, there's a range of ways that we're trying to be creative about the diminishing supply of land that government does control in order to be able to create new affordable housing. But I would also go back to my earlier point that I, I think government too often overlooks the enormous power that it controls through the regulatory land use process. And that um, whether it's inclusionary zoning or a range of other means that government can, can use to, as I think we would say, to harness the market that, that's out there. Um, I, I think there are very, very promising means in going that direction. If you look uh, at the new construction that's going up on the waterfront in Greenpoint, Williamsburg, these are some of the most beautiful residential sites in the universe. Views across the river to all of Manhattan. What's the rent going to be? Uh, spectacular sites, but the new, <laughs> the new construction that's going up there is it will include a substantial amount of affordable housing, something that never would have been possible simply through putting public subsidy into Can it. We, we needed the zoning. Affordable? I keep hearing this in Harlem. They're challenging it, the word affordable. It, in, that, in that case, it will <laughs> all be um, dedicated to low-income families. So uh, what you're talking about for uh, a typical unit, for a family of four, you'd be talking about uh, $35,000, $40,000 a year in income. Um, for a single person, you'd be talking more like twenty dollars to $25,000 a year in income. Jonathan, do you want to talk about the acquisition fund that and MacArthur's role there, or Sean? Is I think uh, Sean uh, should, but we also have uh, Florence Davis here, Star Foundation, also a partner and big investor. You need something. That's right, you all could talk about it. <laughs> it seems like somebody should talk about it. Well, I, I'll just add to what Sean said by saying that it's really about, Florence, did you want to say something? Oh, okay. Um, that it's really about finding um, the right partnerships where, the, where it's not that we're looking to pay the highest value for land and the additional, um, the resources that other city agencies, the, the sort of um, beyond HPD are bringing to the table, HRA and DOE, Sean mentioned. But in addition to that, we're also partnering with, with places like um, public libraries and churches where they have a, an interest in, in an outcome that can remain affordable. So that's just another way of looking at it. As far as the acquisition loan fund goes, the, the idea, and this is clearly a place, and we thank the Star Foundation and, and MacArthur and others for their leadership here um, to bring together um, foundation resources that would attract the um, the banks to assist us in providing a fund that would enable us to purchase land and to be able to do it quickly in a way that would enable us to perhaps get the best price and certainly to be able to expand the city's um, resources to buy, um, to build new affordable housing. So, I don't know if you want to add something else to that, but... I, I can simply say we uh, invested because we have enormous uh, confidence um, in the mayor and Sean and in the network of um, not-for-profit uh, builders and uh, managers and the capacity of the city to do something about uh, this problem and to uh, lead the way for the rest of the country. And I should just add, add one little plug that we are having a series of policy breakfasts this spring that are going to focus on precisely this issue to sort of highlight the creative ways that various organizations around the city are finding land for new, new ways to find land for affordable housing. Um, 
and and I think um, and and also sort of explore some of the the ongoing challenges. So, yes. My name is Rob Hollander. Uh, I run a net called. Uh, if I speak, I think you need to use the mic. Use the mic. Just don't touch it. <laughs> My name is Rob Hollander. I run a network called the Lower East Side Residents for Responsible Development. The Lower East Side is currently uh, undergoing a rezoning. Um, uh, Ms. Scott mentioned the priority of preservation. And uh, Mr. Donovan mentioned uh, the rebuilding of communities. And I think we're seeing these two in conflict with one another. And it arises in uh, uh, inclusionary zoning that you've mentioned, um, most particularly in the mayor's uh, requirement that inclusionary zoning only be applied where there is an upzoning in the neighborhood. Um, so what inclusionary zoning really brings into the neighborhood is, yes, 20% affordable housing, but only under the condition that there be uh, an upzoning and an upscaling of a community. And uh, the result can be, uh, as you know, with an upscaling of a community, uh, tremendous displacement and a loss of preservation. Uh, and there's the possibility of a net loss of affordable housing. Um, this is what we're facing in the Lower East Side now a uh, neighborhood that has been uh, undergoing wild gentrification and now is facing the possibility of further upscaling with inclusionary zoning. We've seen this also in Williamsburg and what's happening in Williamsburg has uh, caused a lot of concern uh, for the people who were living in Williamsburg. And, uh, and our concern is that neighborhood or community rebuilding is very much different from community preservation. Um, something is now being planned for Harlem as well uh, all over the city, we're seeing um, a rise in real estate values that may have beneficial effects for some people, but it may have detrimental effects for others. I would say what you've put your finger on is one of the fundamental challenges that we face as a growing city. Um, if you look at where New York was going back a decade, we've added, during the 1990s, we added uh, about 700,000 people net to our population, but added enough housing for only about two to 300,000 of those people. And so we face, one of the primary reasons, I would say, that we face the housing affordability challenges that we do is uh, a housing gap. Uh, NYU recently estimated that housing gap at about 100,000 units. And so clearly, uh, we don't want to lose the character of neighborhoods that makes New York City what it is. It's why probably everybody in this room cares about this the city. On the other hand, we have to figure out a way for the city to grow um, to accommodate our growing population and, frankly, to make the city more affordable. And so that fundamental balance of, uh, in some cases, upzoning, doing it in the right places, doing it in the right way. but. I don't think we can escape the fundamental need to uh, grow the city and to grow uh, the housing stock, um, but we need to do it in a way that's, that is sensitive. And I think that's a balance that oftentimes it's hard to strike, and it's one that we're trying to strike. We tried to strike it in Greenpoint Williamsburg, and I see the inclusionary zoning as a fundamentally important piece of that, something that will make sure that communities remain integrated in a way that I think makes New York City the interesting dynamic place to be. And, and one of the, in fact, one of the components that we created as part of that inclusionary zoning was a preservation component that would buy and preserve and rehabilitate existing affordable housing uh, in that community. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering Can if I, I could just actually, add Actually, just because we've sure. got three other people behind you, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to Two words. I, I would love to see some of, some, of the, more than two. <laughs> some of the money put to uh, displacement, which is a very difficult thing to research, displacement. If we, we could ha see some research done on it, it would be very helpful. Thank you. Right. Ingrid's actually done some very good work on displacement, so I would recommend uh, reading her work on it. Um. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, my question concerns the national level of awareness. In the 2000 presidential debates and the 2004 debates, there wasn't a single question regarding housing or urban development. So the question is, how do we, can anything be done in the next 12 months to get these issues on the agendas of the presidential candidates and in particular, the moderators of those debates and, and the press? Well, I think the answer is yes. And I think that this dialogue that we're having tonight is a beginning. I think that most of us are now working. We've all beefed up our, our work in, in Washington and working with national coalitions to really come up with a, uh, a housing agenda for this current Congress and certainly to inform the next presidential administration. It does require that we make some concerted effort, and so I think that perhaps even out of this, um, out of this forum tonight, there may be something that, that comes out early as a statement of what, of what the practitioners in this room, and, and, and let us join with people around the country. But there is movement going on. I think that at all levels of government, I'm encouraged by the level of discussion that I'm hearing. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that the next, um, the next presidential campaign will have housing on its agenda. But there is more work for us to do to make sure that that really happens. The uh, questioner did not identify himself, but so I will. Uh, <laughs> his name is Bill Hubbard of the Center Development uh, Corporation, and he and I um, conspired unsuccessfully uh, some years ago to try to uh, preserve a great wasting asset in New York, which is Ellis Island, and the beautiful buildings out there that are being allowed to decay and fall into ruin, and we were going to make a um, campus out there, at least for part of it, uh, where all the universities uh, would contribute to the, the students to go and be part of a semester, a, a kind of a junior year on Ellis Island, looking at questions of uh, mobility, inclusion, uh, and all the rest. Bill, I, I um, think it's exactly right that we need to raise housing on the national agenda in this campaign, and MacArthur supporting a number of networks of uh, not-for-profit organizations uh, working on housing, and they'll be, uh, you know, aiming to do just that. Organizations like the Housing Partnership Network, the Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future, or the Housing Assistance Council, which focuses on rural housing. And I think Sean's earlier point uh, is that housing uh, is not just uh, an issue, uh, affordable housing in, in this city. If you look at this map, you can't see it except the, uh, maybe the blue, are places where MacArthur grantees are at work now. And some of those areas are, are rural, and they're certainly not all concentrated on the east and west coast. Yeah. Just uh, since I, I am the researcher on the panel, I do want to put in a plug for research and just call your attention to the fact that um, I think a big component of why welfare reform finally did get on the national agenda was the fact that there was a very rich body of research that had accumulated over time that really told a singular story and uh, was very helpful. And the sort of post-mortem on welfare reform definitely acknowledges the value of the research. Yeah, I, would, I would actually want to echo that comment because I do think the importance of what was announced here tonight by MacArthur is about a long-term strategy to put housing back on the agenda if the research shows what we believe it's going to show, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, one of the things, having seen from the government side where research can make a difference, research that is done well and that ultimately comes back to, uh, as Jonathan said earlier, cost-benefit analysis, I think could be enormously helpful in Washington. Having spent time in Washington um, and seeing the resistance in Congress, part of it is about the lack of perception of the effectiveness of Housing. It's not that people question housing is important to people. It's at some level a fundamental questioning of can government actually get involved and help housing and do the right thing and to be cost effective. And if you take the example recently of the New York New York 3 agreement here in New York State, um, Dennis Culhane at the University of Pennsylvania took administrative data from New York City and showed very clearly that there was an enormous benefit 
in lower usage of emergency rooms and jails and shelters to supportive housing. It was not just about the effect on the individuals, but what was the benefit to the taxpayer, to the broader public, of uh, providing supportive housing. And when we went to uh, negotiate with the state uh, to, to ask them for a billion dollar commitment to supportive housing, we, we literally never would have been able to get that commitment had we not had the evidence to show that in fact, supportive housing was a cost effective solution. Um, and it's, it's that kind of research, I think, more broadly, that could make an enormous difference in Washington to demonstrate the effectiveness of, of the policies that we're all advocating for. So I really, I have to apologize to the people standing at the mic. Um, we are always committed to ending on time here at the Furman Center, but I would like to invite all of you to, we are having a reception across the hallway, and so please bring your questions to the panelists, to Jonathan, they will be there. Um, I also just want to thank, um, first of all, I just would like to uh, uh, ask you for a round of applause for to thank our panelists.